Hello, my name's Barry Sherlock. Thank you for viewing this video from the Hampshire Field Club YouTube channel. It's a joint production of the Hampshire Archives Trust and the Hampshire Field Club and went out in February 2021. It was chaired by Sue Woolgar, who ran the Q&A session, and convened by myself and Roger Otterwill. It's part of an ongoing programme of hands-on local history with presentations posted on the Hampshire Field Club YouTube channel. They can be found by googling YouTube Hampshire Field Club. There are a number of subjects including Hampshire Genealogical Society by Paul Pinhorn, Dealing with the Poor by Phoebe Merrick, the Oxford Historical and Literary Society by Glenn Gilbertson, Publishing Local History by myself and Roger Otterwill, and Archives for Local History, which I did. We're fortunate to have David Lee to talk on film and sound archives. Until 1988, he worked for the BBC and went on to found the Film and Sound Archive, Wessex Film and Sound Archive of the Hampshire Record Office. He ran it with great success until 2014. He's therefore a pioneer in an area of archiving which has enormous potential for local history in extending its sources and generally enlivening its products. The talk lasts for about 30 minutes and is followed by 15 minutes of questions and discussion. Thank you very much. I can't believe it's seven years since I retired. But there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm a little bit rusty on some of the details, but uh, I put this together hoping that you will use film and sound archives in your research. Um, the first question I need to ask is, what are film and sound archives? And I've created a, a very basic definition, which I hope you'll bear with me as I read it out. It's uh, moving images and sound recorded on various media and kept for long-term preservation and access purposes in specialist archives which have purpose-built storage areas with environmental controls and search rooms for researching copies. Now, copies is a very important word there because if you try to play original materials, there's every chance you could do accidental damage to them on, on replay. So the, uh, any film and sound archive should be uh, making copies in various media so that uh, you don't uh, run the risk of doing this damage. Now films can be on a wide variety of formats from 35 millimeter to eight millimeter cine films, video and digital recordings dating from the 1890s to the present day. Sound recordings also come on many different formats from smoky paper to wax cylinders, gramophone discs to audio tapes and digital media dating from the 19th century to the present. Now the archives accept both professional and amateur material which fits their remit and treat them equally using conservation methods appropriate to their format. Now that's, uh, that's as basic and as simple as I can make it but uh, clearly there's a lot more involved in running a film and sound archive than just that but I just figure that will give you a basic idea of what's involved. Now the next question I'm sure people are asking, how can I use them in my research? Uh, film and sound archives can be used in the same way that more traditional archive records are already used for research purposes, such as for local history, genealogy and particular subjects or people. Documentaries, for example, require as much research as a book or article, so it may be used in the same way for gathering information. Oral history interviews contain not just useful details about a place, event or way of life, but have the added bonus of providing a way of speaking, including accents and dialect, and may be challenged by the interviewer during the interview, unlike diaries, letters and official reports. Different viewpoints on the same event and location may also be gathered in a good project. It is worth noting that film and sound archives can be used generically for research. 
They do not have to be specific to a locality or person. For example, WFSA holds a number of films showing home guard activity in various locations, any of which could be used to illustrate and inform your research. Film and sound items can be cited in publications, which include websites and blogs these days, providing either links to existing material on the internet or clips and still frames obtained from archives using the fair dealing exception in the copyright law. This allows clips, but not a substantial part of an item, to be used for the purposes of review, just like quotes from publications and photographs, providing the author, if known, is acknowledged and his moral rights are observed. I go into this in more detail in my user's guide to film and sound, which is now up on the HAP website, I'm glad to say. So this is a very timely talk. As with most archival records, you will need to visit film and sound archives in order to look at their holdings. Wessex Film and Sound Archive at Hampshire Record Office has a dedicated viewing and listening booth in the main search room where you can access copies of its collections or one can make an appointment to use the WFSA search room upstairs with the assistance of Zoe Viney. Here she is. Uh, you would need to do that if you wanted access to the large Southern TV and TVS collection, which have their viewing copies on computer hard drives. And also, of course, one would hope that you would take good advantage of uh, Zoe's knowledge and experience to uh, find what you're looking for. Uh, and she will be very helpful, I'm sure. Right, now going on to um, a genealogical website, which I've got there. Um, Unfortunately, Zoom does not allow me to share um, websites with you. Uh, I've tried very hard to overcome that, but unfortunately, um, I can't go into a live website from Zoom. So what I've done is I've uh, made a screenshot of the uh, front page, as it were, of our Navy. Now, this is a great example of a genealogical research project carried out in this case, on a single ancestor. Alfred J. West was a local pioneer of cinematography from Gosport originally, later moving to Southsea and creating a photography business with his brother, which branched out into moving pictures in 1897. So he's definitely one of the early pioneers. His great grandson, David Clover, produced a full and growing website devoted to the life and work of West, which includes all of the surviving films he made up to 1913, when he sold his business and the original negatives were melted down for their silver content. This is a great loss. It, it happened quite a bit, I'm afraid. Um, it was more um, economical for people to melt down these films because they were perceived to have done their job than, uh, than to keep the originals. So all we have that's left are prints, uh, copies of um, his films that, you know, were in other places. I think um, at the time he was selling copies to various people in his trade. And uh, these are popping up all over the place and David's been finding them, uh, it, uh, which is very exciting, really. Uh, Wessex Film and Sound Archive does hold a few of these and um, therefore you can see them uh, when you come in, but you can also access them on David's website here. So if I could scroll down, which I could, you would see that there's a section devoted to West's films. And these are mostly relating to the Royal Navy. And he actually produced a catalogue, in fact, uh, which uh, shows just what we're missing because um, the catalogue seem to me to hold some really interesting material and uh, it's it's just such a shame that it's gone but I'm afraid this is what happened to early films. They reckon that 80 percent of early silver nitrate films have been uh, melted down or just destroyed because they were a fire hazard. 
Now the next one I'm going to show you is the Ford Transition Project. Um, this is something that you might like to consider uh, as um, an idea from which you can base your own projects of local history on. In this particular case it relates to the Ford Transit Factory site at Swaveling and uh, they looked into the history of it not just for Ford Transit but also what went there before and what has come afterwards which is basically a logistics depot uh, and this was something that took two years and I was one of the volunteers involved. So here is uh, a part of the uh, front cover of the uh, website. Um, the site formed part of Eastleigh Airfield long before the M27 motorway cut the area in half and was notably home to the Cunliffe Owen Aviation Factory during the Second World War. I spent the years 2018 and 2019 enjoying researching the history of the site involving visiting the Solent Sky Museum in Southampton and the National Motor Museum at Bewley. It was my specific task to discover film and sound archive material which we could use for the project. So naturally, I also went back to WFSA and found some useful items there. In fact, I was able to use some of them in a presentation in the cinema at the record office later on. Now you can see there that the aim of the project was to produce a comprehensive website showing all of the things we achieved, including a pop-up exhibition um, in containers on the uh, factory site, which later appeared in a much smaller form at Eastleigh Museum and Hampshire Record Office lobby. Other achievements included community engagement in Swaveling, work with local schools, recording interviews with former employees of Ford, Briggs and Cunliffe Owen, and a timeline showing the history of the site. Film and sound archive material is well represented on the website and really helps to bring to life what some people might regard as a specialist or rather dull subject. But in fact, it tells the story of um, uh, post Second World War industrial uh, development in, in Southampton, uh, in just one aspect, of course. And uh, I must say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed being one of many uh, volunteers, uh, all of whom were excellent people, some of them local, and um, people like, you may have heard of Padmini Broomfield, uh, a freelance oral historian who used to work for the Southampton Oral History Unit. She was very much involved in the interviews with the former employees, drawing on what she'd done several years previously when the factory closed down and adding more to, uh, to those with the help of um, lo local volunteers. So that, uh, that's, you know, well worth going on. And I should say that this and Alfred West's um, uh, links are on the user's guide uh, on the HAT website. So you can find them on there very quickly. Now, the next question uh, you're bound to ask, I think, is where can I find film and sound archives? Now, outside of Hampshire, uh, these are a list of uh, some of the uh, places where you could find film and sound archives. Um, obviously, uh, some of these will uh, obviously have um, items of interest to Hampshire. In fact, uh, probably all of the ones on that list will. Um, they either hold material of local or generic interest to researchers in Hampshire. And this reflects the situation regarding traditional archives, of course, where collections of interest to one locality may well be held by another record office, for example. In the case of Film Archives, I know that the other members of Film Archives UK hold footage relating to Hampshire taken during holidays and visits in the past, for instance. So that it's definitely worth looking at those. Again, these are on the user's guide. Across uh, the UK, these are the main um, archives that cover uh, the bulk of the country. The main one being the BFI National Archive, of course. Uh, the British Library Sound Archive is by far the biggest sound archive in the country. Massive amounts of material there, which are rapidly becoming available online as well. 
of course the Imperial War Museum is well known and uh, the National Motor Museum has a very good collection of motoring throughout the country. Now all of, uh, <coughs> increasingly thanks to digitization projects uh, more items from film and sound archives are becoming available on the internet as you can see. Uh, this enables desktop research to take place and items can be purchased if you wish. Uh, these are just the newsreels um, and I've taken a snapshot of the British Pathé site and as you can see um, British Pathé bought up all of these previously standalone uh, film archives that were newsreels in the past and um, they have a, a very big collection indeed and uh, virtually all of them are now available online. You go obviously go up to the search box, put in um, you know whatever you want to search for uh, and it should come up with something and I know for a fact that there's a lot of good material there on Hampshire so it's well worth looking into uh, as are the other two uh, newsreels that uh, were listed before. Again this is on the user's guide uh, and of course all of these websites have catalogues or indexes so one can look up what they might contain of interest to you. Now, this is my guide to finding Wessex Film and Sound Archive material on the Hampshire Record Office online catalogue. Uh, when you go into uh, the catalogue you need to go into uh, the advanced search area and you can put in um, in the any text box uh, anything you like um, the more specific the better I would suggest but I put in Swanmore just to see what there is in film and sound form on this particular locality. Uh, you'll notice the level box is a copy because um, that's all you can look at when uh, you go into the online catalogue and of course when you actually go into uh, Wessex Film and Sound Archive or the Hampshire Record Office you will have to cite the uh, copy number or reference and under format you have a choice uh, of either video recordings the film and video or sound recordings for sound. Uh, don't choose any of the others because um, you won't get very far. There's one actually called Cine Films but that was really used for, uh, for me when I was showing films uh, to groups uh, when I had the, the old Cine projector. Now this is what comes up when you click on uh, search for Swanmore uh, and these are film and sound items so you've got both there and these are the first 10 of 49 that you can see there and you'll see that they are items uh, well you know 49 is not bad for Swanmore I would have said and, and obviously um, they're in different collections. Now I've chosen a particular item from that list and you'll see it's the uh, second item from the Green Family Film Collection which is a, a series of home movies showing the Green family of Swanmore. Some of you may uh, know the, the family. Um, David Green was the one that I uh, received these from. Uh, I don't know if he's still with us, perhaps he's not. But when you look through the description, um, apart from the usual things that you would expect uh, to see in a home movies uh, selection, uh, right in the middle there is home guard drilling in field and weapon training. Now if you'd have put uh, in the original text uh, box uh, say Swanmore Home Guard then you should come up with this item uh, straight away and it will give you um, a, you know a, a good idea of what there is in that particular uh, film and you'll notice that the content description is considerably fuller than you might find for say a, a, a text document. Now uh, this is because obviously there's, there could be a lot of different subjects and events and locations in any one reel of film and certainly the case in this one. Right, these are websites containing Wessex Film and Sound Archive films and right at the top you'll notice that the, uh, they have their own YouTube channel. Again this is on the user's guide so you can click on that to see there are you know a uh, one or two hundred items at the moment and I know they're being added to all the time um, 
uh, and Zoe's doing a good job of creating uh, compilations on particular subjects or themes as well. Um, there's a little bit on, on Vimeo, for those of you who know that site, mainly Portsmouth on film. That was put on there at um, uh, when I was um, still at the archive. Uh, BFI Britain on film is uh, part of the BFI player uh, site, which is very, very big already. Uh, the Britain on film section is uh, deliberately designed for um, members of the uh, Film Archive UK members. Um, we actually uh, <coughs> benefited from a digitization project uh, which was run by the BFI and uh, these films uh, have been loaded on so that you can view them. Uh, Flickr does actually have uh, moving footage as well as still footage so you can look those up. Films from the home front uh, which was a very good project again uh, members of the uh, Film Archive UK uh, archives were able to uh, put material on there giving um, you know quite detailed content descriptions as well as articles about life on the home front and at the bottom there um, a revelation perhaps to some of you the New Forest Gateway website um, this is run by uh, amongst others Dr Manuel Hinge who is a natural history uh, uh, filmmaker and he was, a, he was able to persuade uh, the BBC, ITV, local uh, ITV, and um, uh, even British Pathé to uh, allow him to uh, put uh, material relating to the New Forest on his website. So again, that's well worth looking at to, to see what there is there. Right, now this is uh, the BFI player, Britain on Film, and you'll see that the uh, green film, Home Movies in Swanmore, is actually on there. Unfortunately, I can't show you that, which I was hoping to, because again, Zoom doesn't allow me to share that. But I thought you'd like to see that and uh, know that you can go into BFI Player and actually uh, look at that film. Now I'm going to finish on examples of film and sound items. Um, you'll notice uh, there's the sound and uh, film. And I'm going to start with uh, this particular um, item from the Survey of English Dialects, which is held by the British Library Sound Archive. It's, um, it was particularly uh, set up by the University of Leeds um, in the late 1950s and early 1960s and uh, it's held by the British Library Sound Archive in audio tape form and it includes a recording of an interview with Charlie, surname withheld, of Hatherden in East Hampshire from 1948. Uh, but I can help you to listen to it even though you can't see anything particular. Right, here we go. Can you tell us what you did when you left school? The first job I had, mm. shepherding. Ah, I helped with the sheep for about six months. Mm. What did you have to do when you were doing that? In, well, we sheep. Carried the hurdles. Then I learned a way to pitch and pitch the hurdles. Just helped the shepherd feed them. A bit of hay and, you know, and a bit of cake. We used to have a bit of cake then, though. Mm. Did they, look, did they look after them a bit different in those days than they do now? Oh, not much, not much, not the Hampshire Downs lot. But they, uh, they used to have a bit of cake then, see? And perhaps in the, uh, in the lamb cake, you used to have some locusts. Locusts was good to eat. Well, we used to get this year locusts and start this start lamb's food over and get the locusts out, lot, see? Peacocks and all that in there, see? And you got your locust beans, lot, see? That used to be sweet, look. We used to get, uh, get puck for that and keep chewing and chewing. You know, always take them a, a pack of all the locusts, see? There was always somebody running around with some locusts at night. Mm -hmm. What's locusts exactly? Well, locusts are uh, it's a bean, locust beans. Mm -hmm. They come, they don't grow in this country, I think they're imported, though, these locust beans. They're a sweet, sort of a, uh, a soft woody thing, sweet as syrup they are. Mm -hmm. You've a lot of locusts uh, used for getting a sheep one time. Mm -hmm. Were there more sheep in those days than there are now? Oh, more sheep than about in them days, and there is now. Mm. And then what did you do when you left the shepherd? Um, 
went garden boy at Clamwell Lodge mm -hmm. for uh, for oh. Captain Faith. He was a captain then, but he. Uh... Evening. Evening. Hello. Oh, then when I um, used to uh, weed the garden and uh, look at her uh, chickens and that, and uh, lead the pony when it was lawn mowing, you know, all jobs like that. Mm -hmm. Used to always have me, always used to bring me out my lunch if I didn't go in the house and get it. Always used to bring it out. I used to have it out the, on the lawn. Mm -hmm. That was a cup of hot milk and some bread and butter. I see. What was this tale you were telling me about going, somebody went up to Bedwin or somewhere, didn't they? Oh, that's when I, uh, oh, Joe, have you gone? That's, um, I went up there once, when I was a boy, and went to Whale, Whalebury, see, Strongsbury at Whale, it was uh, all the horses then, look, see, double work and single, see, the vans, look, see, used to have bells on them, see, used to deliver his beard up with horses, see. Well, this old boy says, going for a ride, Charles. I said, ah, I said, I'll come. He, I said, where are we going then? Oh, he says, going up the Bedouin. So, uh, gets up the Bedouin, look, gets to the pub. Of course, the, the first uh, thing he had to do was to put the nose bag on, look. He always had the nose bag, see, with all the arse. So, he put the nose bag on, and long come a bit of, long come a party, long on the road, and dressed up well she was. So, she says, what a nice arse that is, and patted him on the neck, see. A little nipper come along, he says, Don't they go talk near you? Or just had a bloody kid rav. Or what's the hotter it was, or couldn't help herself, or couldn't. And this your party getting such a smack up out of your own knocking for six. <laughs> right. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to show an example now from uh, a film, well, three films actually held by the Film and Sound Archive. Um, these are taken from the Wessex Film and Sound Archive channel on YouTube. It's a compilation celebrating the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife in 2020 on the 12th of May, which some of you will know was also the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale's birth. So that's, uh, that's an interesting one. So hopefully this will work. And we start with, um, these are all silent films, I should say. And these are nurses training at a factory during the Second World War. Uh, they're obviously not using real patients there. <laughs> but, um, you, yeah, it's very interesting to see the, the costume, the, the, the uniform, I should say, uh, particularly the headdresses. And there's a chap helping uh, a nurse deal with his arm. And this was actually a factory in uh, Newbury, uh, which was making uh, Spitfires and other things. Now this is now going back to 1928 and is the Lord Mayor Trelaw Hospital in Alton. Um, and basically they're using heliotherapy, intense light treatment of tuberculosis and related bone diseases. So these are the uh, things they were using to intensify the light on particular sections of the body. And you'll notice they have to wear glasses. Now we jump to the 1950s and we're in Southampton now, the Royal Southampton Hospital and the General, where again nurses are training and uh, you can compare the uh, uniforms with the earlier film. And it, you also get uh, so it shows you the, the hospital uh, bed making. Now you'll, you'll probably notice that they're moving uh, slightly faster than reality. Uh, this is because um, when uh, filmmakers 
are indoors with lower light levels, um, they have to uh, film at a slower rate in order to get a good image. And But when you obviously project it at a normal speed later on, it comes out slightly faster than real life. That's why it looks a bit strange. Unfortunately, this happens rather a lot on television. Uh, they don't uh, they, they don't adjust the uh, the speed. Well, there's Matron. We've only just got those back in the NHS. So if anybody was working as a nurse in the 50s and 60s, this will look very familiar. So there we are. Thank you for watching and listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, I feel I must at this point just uh, give everybody that's um, going to want to follow up David's uh, advice guide and, and where to find things and the things you were referring to during the course of your talk. Um, if you go to the Hampshire Archives Trust.co.uk website, at the top of the page, the home page, there's a tab that says about. If you go to the about tab, um, and pan down, it'll have a link there to, to Wessex Sound and Film Archive. Or at the bottom of the home page, there's a search bar, uh, a search box, just type in Wessex Sound and Film and it will take you straight to that page. But I think I will also, Barry, if you are happy to do this, um, we'll um, copy the link to Barry and Barry can uh, send it out to the people who attended the talk this evening. So that you can follow it up from that link. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, David is happy to take questions. If you can do that through the chat button, and I will um, talk a little more while you're having chance to get your your thoughts together on what you might like to ask, and just refer back to the Fords project that you uh, volunteered on, David, because like you, I'm slightly surprised at how long I've been retired. I retired in 2016. And one of my last projects I worked on before I retired was um, the closing down of the plants at Fords. Yeah. And <laughs> to my absolute amazement, I was invited to go along and watch the last one of the last production lines running through, well, lucky which you. was absolutely fascinating, I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, never seen anything like it. Probably won't see anything like it ever again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, very enthusiastic, enthusiastic group of uh, workers there, and and. I think we, we were largely dealing with some of this of um, the managers who'd been there, man and boy kind of thing. And they had so many stories to tell about their time, their time there. It was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I was particularly interested in the um, very small minority of ladies who worked there and how they were treated by the men. Um, that yeah. came out in the project quite well. Right, so I've got a, a, a chat coming through from Ian Wegg, which was about how, where he finds the, the, um, the guide, which I think I've covered. Uh, Anna, you've got a partial, Anna Welsh, you've got a parcel message that come in, but not the full one. So if you could uh, type your message in, that will be very helpful. I think otherwise you've... Um, you completely stumped them, David. They're so <laughs> intrigued with what they've heard. They haven't really got uh, too much in the way of question. Ah, some flooding in now. Uh, Anna Welsh asks, where should, who should I call, who and where should I contact to ask advice about old reels of film, the contents of which are unknown? Well, it depends where they, uh, the reels of film originated. Um, obviously, uh, 
they should be held in an archive if they're of local interest uh, or national interest come to that. And, but, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know what's on the film, then I don't think anyone should try and project them because old film in particular can suffer in, in a projector. So um, I don't know if that's what you were wanting to know. Yeah, I, I took the, the tone to be that she's got some old films, she doesn't yeah. know what's on them and she wants yeah. to, to, to find out. Yeah, so obviously uh, go to your nearest film archive, and uh, which would be Wessex, and yeah, uh, yeah they'll help you. Brilliant. Zoe Viney um, asks, what is your favourite, oh, this is a difficult one, David, oh. what's your favourite film in the collection? Oh, that's terrible. That's, that's It's ridiculous. awful, isn't it? So you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously, the Alfred West films um, going back to 1897 are incredibly rare and uh, interesting just from the point of view of their age and the fact that they've survived at all. Um, you know, there, there's uh, there's some lovely material there and any one of them would be of interest. But the one that really uh, uh, perked my interest was uh, a 1902 film by West showing a Freemasons openly processing in South Sea. And um, <clears throat> part of the procession was um, uh, a local um, Anglican vicar and his um, choir boys and some of his um, clergy and, and he was a prominent Freemason and so they were they were on their way to St Matthew's Church to uh, lay the foundations and that's why he was involved but uh, that was you know that that was really interesting some people see this film and because it's just a parade of people going past a static camera think it's very boring but if you look at it really closely, you know, you've got um, you know, people wearing their Sunday best uh, and you've got all sorts of interesting characters in the parade, including, of course, the Freemasons with their, um, their special regalia. Mm. Excellent. Uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this one, David. Um, Vicky Stacey asks, are there any dates for the reopening of uh, Wessex Sound and Film Archive? I think that's really on the basis of when Hampshire Record Office reopens, which I think may yeah. almost have been one of the things that um, Prime Minister was uh, yes. asking yesterday, really. But, um, the impression it would be in, in April when um, other yeah. buildings are opening. But you, by implication, you're right, Vicky, it's been closed for quite some time because of the, the lockdown situation. Uh, and I'm sure, um, well, I'm absolutely sure that they, they will take every precaution on reopening to make sure they're COVID safe, but uh, it, it is frustrating. Um, Anna Welsh has come back to us, David, to say that she thinks the films are in York, ah. in her father's house in York. So well, is there a film? There is, there, a uh, York? there is a Yorkshire film archive based in York, so that's the place to go. Right, is that at the university or is that, uh, do yes, you know? Yes, it's, yeah. um, I don't think it's in York University. I think it's in one of the others. Oh, right. OK. I'm sure, I'm sure Google will yes. deliver the results as they always do. Yeah. Um, I, all right. Um, I have another one come in from Charlie Fraser Fleming asking, are there any links to the Farnborough Air Sciences Trust film archive? No, there aren't. I'm not no. sure that means. There are, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if that means in your paper or, 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 on, or any of those um, films online. I imagine if they're online again, a Google search will, mm. will turn oh. them up. Yeah. Okay, I think um, I, I haven't got any other questions coming in, so we'll, we'll let you go shortly, David. But before we... Can, I, can, can uh, I just interrupt there? So I, I've, tried to send, I've tried to send a chat and it doesn't work, so... Oh, really? Oh, apologies for that. I Can I anything... ask a question to David? Yeah, of course. That was an excellent talk, David. Lots of lots of things to follow up there. Hours to be spent, you know, scrolling through the website links you gave. Can I ask you, with digital publishing commonplace today, how easy would it be to produce a book, and that's in quotes, with moving and sound illustrations? I see no reason why you can't produce um, a digital publication like that. Um, you know, you can insert anything nowadays digitally. 
obviously the the film or sound would have to be digitized to begin with and then um, and then obviously uh, either you get permission to put the whole thing in uh, which would require um, you know extensive uh, research on that line and obviously permission from the archive which holds it or obviously you could do a link to something that's already online and there's more and more material like that um, <clears throat> but um, generally speaking if you just wanted to show um, a clip or a still frame then you've got the, uh, the, the <coughs> fair dealing exception to copyright law. I should uh, you give me an opportunity here actually Barry to mention that the user's guide has um, a comprehensive section on copyright and how to use films um, in that context so uh, you know there's there's plenty of detail there. Yeah, I don't think we can plug your user's guide too much so if anybody <laughs> wants to know how to follow this up the user's guide is on the HAP website it's yeah. hot off the press, as it were. It's been on a couple of days. So, so we could produce then. Why don't we produce a book on Hampshire with film and sound in it? I think people might be, um, you know, looking more traditionally. Um, I can compare it with those oral history projects where um, the tapes are transcribed into text and the text is used in a book and quite often the tapes are not kept. Um, unfortunately, this happens all too frequently, even today. So I would uh, urge people to look upon um, film and sound in the same uh, way that they would look at uh, text and, and photographs. But with regard to sound, I think if you've got a transcript which you can read, in, yeah. in some ways that's easier. Oh, yeah. particularly, particularly when you're listening to a shepherd from near yeah. Andover. Yes, but, but um, you're losing a lot in the process. You are losing a lot. So what you could do is you have a little clip of sound and then some transcript, which you could yeah. read. But yeah. I, I think film enlivens text so much that yeah. I would be very interested in talking with you about producing a digital book with film embedded in it. Mm. We could do it as a hat project to sort of show you know, just to demonstrate what we could do. We could even do it on Swan Mall. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. We've, we've had a, um, another chat message come in, really asking what the extent of Wessex is, but particularly, does it cover uh, Dorset? Um, in it, terms of the film and sound yeah. archive, yes. Yeah, when we started in 1988, um, I regarded Wessex as central southern England. Um, it doesn't quite cover all of the area that um, Alfred the Great uh, was in charge of, but, uh, you know, I just felt that uh, Hampshire and surrounding counties was, was reasonable and fair because there was nothing else uh, covering film and sound at that time in those particular counties as well as Hampshire. Um, and then in 2000, the government got involved and imposed these um, regions and if you wanted to apply for any funding at all, you had to comply. And unfortunately, we came into the southeast region, uh, which meant that we uh, had to um, apply for funding along with the Screen Archive Southeast based in Brighton for film funding. And uh, that meant we lost out compared with other areas where there was just the one film archive in that region. Uh, now, I believe we've been shoved over to the southwest, <laughs> where, where we still share, Wessex Film and Sound Archive still shares um, it with the Southwest Film Archive uh, based in Plymouth. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, when funding's concerned, you, you have to comply with mm. whatever you can get hold of. So where does that leave Dorset then? Um, well, we've got Southwest? <laughs> a little bit of Dorset um, has found its way from the early years of Wessex Film and Sound Archive, but um, since the uh, government imposed these uh, regions on us, we've, uh, we've had to uh, leave it alone, basically, and along with Wiltshire, mm -hmm. I might say. We had some very mm -hmm. good material on Salisbury. Yeah, okay. Uh, one for you, Barry. Observation for you after your chat with David. Glenn tells us that um, the first Microsoft en encyclopedia incorporated video clips. So there's clearly someone's been there and done it. So yes, there's a, definitely a, a uh, precedent there. Um, we ought to copy it for local history then, Glenn. We no, ought to not, copy not it. specifically for now. No. 
Uh, unless anybody's got any more questions, I think we should probably draw our meeting to a close or to talk to a close. But um, Barry's quite keen for me to plug the next talk. So let me do that without further ado. It's going to be held on the, I mean, you've, you've already gathered that these talks fall on the last Tuesday of the month, but it will be on the 30th of March and it will be by David Taylor. I'm told David was a, is a former school teacher in the county with a great interest in the magistracy. And he's going to be talking about an overflowing in tray, the Hampshire Magistracy. Oh dear, because that's going to be a difficult one. I hope he can manage it better than I can. So if you can put that in your diary, there will be the usual postings on the hat calendar and Barry will circulate, I'm sure, all the people who are normal attendees to these talks. Um, and uh, yes, we'll see you all, all then. Uh, unless there are any further comments, are you happy, Barry, for me to draw the meeting to a close? Do. So can I just um, oh, yes, Roger, chip in at this point? Of course. Um, just to backtrack slightly on the issue of Wessex, of course, until 1974, um, Bournemouth and Christchurch, ah, yes, which Christ were in, uh, now in Borset, mm -hmm. were in Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And the record office has got a lot of um, material relating to them. I've been looking for some photographs of Bournemouth um, to illustrate an article I wrote um, and I've written and um, I assume David that you've got some clips from Bournemouth and um, Christchurch area in the film archive. Yes, pre-1974. Pre-1974, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, I just plug the talk that's coming on the 27th of April, because um, the person who's giving it is in our audience this evening. Uh, Dean Morin will be speaking about parish histories, um, the VCH way. And I'm a member of the VCH team, yeah. so I have a vested interest in plugging okay. this. Um, so um, watch out for that one. Thank you, sir. So I'm, I'm going to complete, continue plugging then. We do have a list that Barry and Roger have given me of the talks that are coming up over the, the well, not quite the rest of the year, but certainly in, until um, till the end of, uh, till the summer. Um, and uh, very apposite, uh, very appropriate after today's talk, um, one, we've got a, a young couple of people who have just emerged from the University of Winchester having done a film production uh, qualification who are doing um, a section on making local history films so that seems particularly appropriate but we do Barry and Roger have produced a program that runs from now until the end of June um, and no doubt there'll be more although um, I think we're going to take a break over the summer um, July June July and August but um, I don't know if it'd be worth Barry next time you circulate people with talks you circulate them with the list if you haven't already done so of what's coming up Yes, I'm happy to do that. Might make the email yeah. a bit, bit too long, but I'll, uh, yeah, good idea. And yeah. I think it's absolutely fantastic uh, that you've drawn uh, 60, more than 60 screens, David. 68, 68 participants. Yes. Yeah, right, yeah. That's fantastic. We look forward yeah. to seeing you all next time.